Okay, we'll go ahead and get started right now. Um, thank you all for joining us and welcome to the webinar. My name is Cameron Herbelsheimer, Program Coordinator at the National Association of Regional Councils. If you should have any technical questions during the webinar, please email me directly. My information is on the welcome screen you see in front of you. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Ben Prohaska, Director of Strategic Initi Initiatives at the Electrification Coalition. Ben will provide an overview that will include general information about the current status of the Volkswagen settlement, the anticipated timeline, and how this funding can be used to accelerate vehicle electrification. There will be time for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. If you have a question during the presentation, please type it into the questions box on your control panel. A video recording of the presentation will be made uh, available following the webinar. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Ben. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. And I'm waiting to uh, take control of the, there we go. You guys got me? Yeah. Is it still showing that little, um, sorry, the, uh, the little box? The toolbar? Yeah. Is it showing that? Is it showing this little box? Is it showing the GoToWebinar box? Sorry. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. For whatever okay. reason, it is stuck in front of my presentation, but I think it'll be okay. Okay, sorry. Um, we're just uh, demonstrating that all uh, GoToWebinar features seem to have some form of technical difficulties that are probably mostly isolated to um, uh, poor user control. So my name is Ben Prohaska. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the, the VW settlement. Um, as, a, as a connection, I'm going to give you all a brief sort of um, background on who the Electrification Coalition is, uh, since some of you may or may not be familiar and some of the projects that we work on. And then after that, I will go through some of the specifics of the, um, of the settlement and, and the consent decree and what that means on a state-by-state uh, -state basis and what it could mean over the next um, several years for electrification. So um, as background, the Electrification Coalition uh, is basically a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of business leaders. And the way I like to say it is it's a group that represents the entirety of the EV supply chain. So it's, it starts at the moment where the ore is taken out of the ground and turned into lithium battery. Uh, we work with the lithium battery makers. We work with the original um, equipment manufacturers, or OEMs, as it's often referred to, so the car makers. Uh, we work with the charging station manufacturers. Uh, and then we also work with other um, nonprofit advocacy organizations and policy groups around the country. Um, we are not a trade association, though, so even though we work with in the industry or work with the industry, uh, we have still maintained a very, very specific approach around the idea that we are advocating for the um, mass scale adoption of plug-in electric vehicles. Um, so a little bit about why. Why do we care and you know what's the rationale for wanting to support the accelerated adoption of plug-in electric vehicles? Um, big part of this is it's centered around the idea of reducing, reducing our national dependence on oil. Um, some of you may have been connected to this issue on the ground um, through your, your various regional um, councils of government, and, and there's lots of connections to this issue when you think about uh, as CMAQ money or other funding buckets are doled out. Uh, but in this case, um, the, the Electrification Coalition uh, it was an offshoot of another organization called Securing America's Future Energy. And we um, created something called the Oil Shockwave, which basically showed what would happen if there was a cutoff in supply or significant changes in price. And it basically puts our country at great economic and national security risk. And there's some really telling signs just on this particular slide uh, with the idea that 94% of our transportation sector is entirely reliant on oil uh, to get from point A to point B. And um, by creating that oil shockwave and that demonstration, we were able to galvanize the interest of a group of folks, including some of the um, largest end users, like FedEx, who's one of the greatest or most significant petroleum users in the world, uh, but then also members of um, our armed forces, so retired four-star admirals, generals, and others, who engage in this issue and can act with great authority to talk about the importance of ending our reliance on oil or our dependence on oil. Out of that, we started the Electrification Coalition with the, the idea that EVs, represent the best scalable alternative. They're one of the few uh, transportation opt options where it is a omni-fuel or a multi-fuel 
uh, and you can power a vehicle by plugging into the grid and using any number of ways to generate that electricity. And so it really creates the best diversity. Some background, though, is that it also, why is electricity um, a huge benefit? And I outline this, uh, or we outline this, and the idea that it's, it's simple, it's domestic. So majority of electricity production happens at the domestic level. Uh, something in the neighborhood of 98% of our electricity is produced uh, right, right here at home and oftentimes very close to where people live. Um, it's also diverse, so it has the opportunity to be created by wind, solar, uh, nuke, natural gas, you, you know, et cetera, any ways that you can generate and create those electrons. Uh, historically, electricity has been cheap, and I think that you know, this chart does a great job of helping articulate that. Um, if you look at that bottom blue line, it shows that electricity prices, and it's, you know, often cases a regulated market, but have largely stayed static uh, throughout the, a number of years. And so it really is important, especially when you're thinking about a, you know, accounts government or other uh, um, fleets, but even as a private consumer, the idea that you can plug into the grid, you're powering it through electricity, it's domestically produced, it's ubiquitous, but then you can also count on the price staying fairly inexpensive. Uh, and that is not the case with oil. Um, and I think, you know, oil is a very, very, gra you know, graphic example of how we see huge price spikes um, either both up or down. And it's also... Uh, it's an international commodity, and so it's controlled by national oil companies and uh, folks connected to oil, o OPEC who continually try to manipulate the oil markets and obviously leaves us at great economic and national security risk. So EVs represent one of the best scalable alternatives, and you're going to see why this connects to uh, the VW settlement shortly. Um, but just I thought this would be helpful to see a context of the vehicle market uh, in relationship to other fuels. Um, and so you can see that uh, we've seen a significant uptake over the last uh, several years um, around the adoption of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, which would be like a Chevy Volt or um, uh, a, a Ford C-Max. And these are vehicles that essentially plug into the grid, uh, have a smaller battery, uh, and have a range of anywhere from 20 to upwards of 50, 60, 70 miles. Um, that they can use full battery electric to travel a majority of the miles that they travel. And then you also have full EV, which is a vehicle that can only travel by plugging into the grid. Um, and so this shows the adoption numbers. And we are now at a pretty significant stage where uh, EVs uh, have finally eclipsed that half a million mark and are really starting to um, see a significant number come out of the market, uh, especially in the coming years. And you may have heard, but the Bolt with a B, uh, is going to be the newest entry, and it's hitting some markets already, but it's one of the first low-cost, high-range plug-in electric vehicles or full battery electric vehicles um, that's EP rated at 238 miles on a single charge. So this just gives a sense, and part of the reason I wanted to articulate this and show this is that while other fuels are going to be an important part of the transportation segment, you can see that CNG or hydrogen um, or some of these other options tend to be a very small part of the overall vehicle sales market. Um, and then I think this is also just a helpful piece around, as I mentioned, this idea of getting to the half a million mark, um, is that this shows what the market percentages or market penetration levels are so far. Um, and if you were to take a look at this, you see hybrid electric vehicles. So that is more like your traditional Prius hybrid. And it shows, um, and this is helpful to see the context of EVs, which is this, the top line is the EV market, and then the bottom lines are the hybrid electric market and what's happened through those first five um, to six years of introduction. And, you know, EVs were on a very, very high arc, quick moving up. Um, and then, as you might imagine, during the 2015, we saw a bit of a dip um, because of the cost of fuel driving down so much. Uh, however, 2016 is a place where we're starting to see a decoupling around fuel costs and the EV market growth, but it's something that continues to need um, more and more attention and more and more growth. So now we have um, some background on quick things that we do uh, to help try and push that growth. Uh, we've created its EV accelerator communities, the idea that you can pull multiple levers on the ground um, to influence adoption. We kicked off our first one in northern Colorado. Uh, and in this case, we've seen sales increase to be three times the national average. Um, and the idea is that um, by creating accelerator communities, you can rapidly increase the adoption uh, through a triple helix approach. So systems of government, uh, engaging the business community, uh, NGOs, obviously, but also then uh, the, the uh, private sector and universities. 
Um, and so that's a good example of our program in northern Colorado, and we've developed specific efforts out of that, uh, and an example being a group by program that have now uh, been uh, replicated around the country. We also, uh, just in the idea that we want to be able to test different approaches, created something called Drive Electric uh, Orlando, and this program uh, basically utilizes the tourism industry in Orlando and uh, the idea that by putting people behind the wheel of a plug-in electric vehicle for an extended test drive, we can increase the likelihood that they will purchase the vehicle when they go home. And so we picked Orlando because it's one of the most visited cities in America. Uh, and right now we work with Enterprise, who's renting the vaults, and we have been able to create charging stations at 35 hotels and then multiple theme parks in the area, specifically Disney and, um, and uh, um, uh, the Sorry, not but not SeaWorld, but the other one. For whatever reason, I'm blanking on the name of the other one. But ultimately, two of the major theme parks that are there. Um, and the idea in this, you know, and how it's going to have an impact uh, is that by renting these vehicles, um, Enterprise, through a study with IHS, basically shows that when people rent a car, um, it, it impacts the likelihood of purchasing a vehicle they rented by 55%. So it can have a dramatic impact on the likelihood that they will purchase an EV. Uh, we also have created something called the Energy Secure Cities Coalition. Um, the idea here is that we are working with multiple cities around the country uh, to get them to make a commitment to go oil-free by 2025. And we've gotten eight cities to make that commitment, and we are recruiting an additional 17. Um, and this is really, in some ways, it's the opportunity to create top-down support, so getting mayors and others invested. It kicked off in Indianapolis. Uh, and now Atlanta is one of the major cities that is undertaking great efforts to transition uh, their vehicle fleet to plug-in electric vehicles, uh, and they're on pace to transition about 200 over the next year and a half. Um, and that's something that certainly, as you think about ways to engage, whether it's a fleet manager who's the operational side or it's the mayors and others who are the decision maker sides, um, this can be a great mechanism to engage those decision makers and help really create a, um, a push to move electrification forward. Um, additionally, we recently participated in the Smart City Challenge. We were the lead implementation partner uh, with Vulcan. And uh, if you aren't aware, uh, basically 78 cities applied uh, to participate to become uh, one of the national leaders in transitioning uh, their transportation sector. Uh, it was down selected to seven finalists. This says five right there. If you look at the document, but that was because there was, it was so competitive that seven cities were collect, uh, selected as finalists. So Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, um, Denver, uh, Austin, Kansas City, Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, and Pittsburgh. And after a very rigorous effort with those finalists, we uh, worked with them. And then the DOT and Vulcan helped select uh, the winner, which was Columbus, who's in the process of developing an incredibly comprehensive program uh, over the next two to three years to help transition and show what the future can look like for our transportation sector. And then finally, our connection to the National Association of Regional Councils is we are part of a, a program called Fleets for the Future, uh, which is the idea of creating a replicable model for aggregated vehicle purchasing. Um, and so uh, we are the technical guide for this or technical support and continue to be very engaged uh, both with this, but also, as you can imagine, it connects very well to some of our other programs around driving adoption. Um, so now that you've had that framing and background on the EC, um, let's talk about the, e the, the VW settlement. So uh, basically, the EPA filed a complaint against Volkswagen alleging that they had violated the Clean Air Act. And recently, um, it was a, there was a consent decree that came uh, forward um, that the Volkswagen agreed to uh, that is going to put a significant amount of funding on the ground that can be used to help push electrification forward. So some background on the consent decree. Um, so it was filed in, in 2016. Uh, it was actually recently uh, finalized uh, on October 26th, so very recently. Um, and uh, there are several components to it that I'll break down. But a big part of this, if you look at the very part, bottom portion, there's three parts. There's $10 billion, uh, which will be for VW customers and then also as part of their buyback program, um, which some of you may have heard about. And then there are two specific buckets of funding, $2.7 in environmental mitigation trust fund money 
and two billion in ZEV investment. And ZEV in this case means zero emission vehicle investment. And this is kind of how that breaks down just so you see it in a different sort of form uh, to show the settlement breakdown and what that would look like. So what does the money do uh, and how is it sort of allocated? The 2.7 billion on environmental, mitig environmental mitigation trust fund, um, it, it basically shows some of the breakdown here, but a big part of this is around NOx mitigation, which is one of the biggest uh, pollutants that they were, um, you know, they basically were uh, circumventing through their emissions controls. And, um, and so this money uh, right now is being allocated to states uh, based on a percentage of the vehicles that are in those states uh, with the idea that then it'll go into a trust count, there'll be a beneficiary designated in each specific state, um, and each state has a certain amount of money that they'll be able to use in various forms, and I'll talk about that. The second part is $2 billion that'll be in ZEV, in, in ZEV investment uh, over 10 years. Um, and this will largely be uh, controlled by VW, uh, but it'll be approved through uh, the EPA and CARB, which is the Clean Air Resources Board in California. Um, and a big part of that money will be uh, specifically already allocated to CARB, uh, or to California, excuse me, uh, where 800 million out of that 2 billion is already going to be basically cut off and prioritized for California. Um, but there, this is basically where VW, through this process and working with uh, approval from the EPA, will be looking for shovel-ready projects around the country uh, to create uh, ZEB investments um, and, and zero emission vehicles and investments over the next 10 years. So about the mitigation fund, um, as I mentioned, it is focused on NOx emissions. Um, and so you can see some of the beneficiaries that I didn't mention before, but also include Native American tribes um, and DC and then Puerto Rico. Um, and what is eligible under the mitigation action? Uh, it, it actually creates a pretty big opportunity for different communities to think about ways to do NOx mitigation. We obviously think that electrification is going to be one of the best uh, steps forward and, and look at this money as being a great mechanism to do that. But there are lots of other eligible places. So you can do um, uh, up to class eight uh, freight trucks and, and dry drives trucks, uh, class four through eight shuttle buses and, and transit buses. Um, you can also use it for uh, uh, ocean going vessels and shore power. Uh, and a number of other things. One of the key places that we think there's a huge opportunity is that 15% of this money in each given state can be allocated towards uh, infrastructure investment, and specifically to develop charging stations um, uh, to support EV adoption. And so a lot of states are looking at that as a first step. Uh, the other money, though, can also be used, uh, and it mentions this, but on um, uh, light duty, uh, or excuse me, medium duty and heavy duty um, uh, transit, and so a big part of that is around transit buses is where there's, there's a lot of interest and a lot of effort being put forward. So if you're wondering, and I don't know what states are on this call or who's represented, uh, but this is a breakdown of the allocations on a per state basis. Um, and one of the things that's really important is that a state has to make the request. So if the state does not designate a beneficiary, and does not make the request, they are essentially uh, saying that they don't want the money. And so if, if you aren't sure it's worth getting in contact, and, and largely it's happening through your governor's office, uh, to confirm that they, A, have uh, made a statement that they do want to receive the funding, and then B, that they're actually starting to put together a plan for how that funding will be utilized. Uh, and this is some information that's available online, but you know, obviously if this is being recorded, uh, if you're not sure what, how much money your state is getting, because it's hard to read this chart very quickly, um, you can come back to the recording and look at that. So in terms of this mitigation piece, um, I, I mentioned some of these, but just to break down some of the key pieces, so um, eight heavy duty and medium duty vehicles, um, you can actually do full replacement costs, and I, I want to point out the last two bullets is that it talks about funding percentage for each action. Um, so in the case of plug-in electric vehicles, they are allowing full replacement costs uh, to be utilized for, for um, uh, buses and other medium or heavy duty uh, vehicles that can meet needs in communities. Um, and then 
Uh, and then I also mentioned the idea that you can use it to replace um, uh, uh, existing diesel and other forms with other, other alternative fuel sources, but obviously we're really encouraging an investment specifically in plug-in electric vehicle choice. And if you're interested, uh, there's a website down at the bottom and a link where you can look at the table uh, and, and a further breakdown if there's specific applications that you're curious about or you think might be appropriate for your community. Um, in terms of timing and next steps, uh, so as I mentioned, the final approval happened on October, I, was, I said 26th, I was off by a day, my apologies, but on October 25th, uh, there will continue to be you know, moments here and there where there will be some questions that come into play, but ultimately it's been decided. Um, and that final approval has happened for, the deep, for this specific um, 2.7 million uh, billion, excuse me, environmental mitigation trust. Uh, each governor's office and, the, and then respect to tribal governments, uh, as I mentioned, will have to file a certification form uh, to become beneficiaries, so no later than 60 days after the effective date. Um, and then they have to submit their plan no later than 30 days after being deemed a beneficiary. So really this is a great opportunity and a great time to be engaged in those discussions. And I have had conversations with several folks, and if you're looking for examples of how this is playing out, uh, you know, Colorado has a good example where through their CDPAG, uh, which is their Division of Health, uh, they've created a plan to engage uh, multiple stakeholders to get feedback uh, on what should happen with the mitigation money or with this, you know, their portion of that uh, environmental mitigation funds. Um, and I would encourage all of you at this point, if you haven't, to be in contact uh, with your governor's office, figure out who the beneficiary is, and then, you know, obviously encourage uh, some of the opportunities and some of the ways that the funding can be used. Um, and in this case, I will mention one other thing, which is there are some who are already uh, thinking about utilizing uh, CMAC money um, as a way to sort of um, plus up or amplify the investments. And so in this case, uh, you know, there's maybe a way to couple existing CMAC funds with this new funding investment uh, to create an even bigger pot of money and an even bigger impact. And that might be a great way to sort of approach the, the, the selected beneficiary or the designee in, in a specific state with a sort of a mechanism to help move this forward. Um, I'm sorry, I hit the button before I intended to. Um, and then there's also this piece around um, the, you know, the effective dates and uh, what can happen next. And so I just mentioned the selection of the trustee. Um, and so this will, that is an important criteria where if the trustee hasn't been designated, that'll need to take place quickly so that they can start to put that plan together. Uh, I do not talk a lot about the ZEV mitigation money uh, or ZEV money, and there's a reason for that. Right now, uh, that is still being dictate, uh, determined, um, and what will happen in that process is that uh, VW um, will, be, will soon be sharing a way for uh, communities and stakeholders to submit uh, funding uh, or funding ideas uh, and program ideas that that could be supported through the VW settlement, and uh, and so I would encourage that everyone continue to keep an eye out if you work with folks who might have um, a specific program idea that could fit into uh, ZEB mitigation uh, or excuse me ZEB uh, zero emission vehicle uh, uh, programs, and so. I'll leave with this piece and obviously open it up to some questions if there are any, uh, that uh, we have helped create a number of documents to provide background and support for um, uh, helping to electrify the transportation sector. And so we have a couple sites on here that I'd encourage you to look at, electrificationcoalition.org. There's a, a publication called the Electric Vehicle Roadmap that takes talks about all the different uh, sort of steps to help accelerate the adoption of plug-in electric vehicles. Um, and there's also something called the Fleet Electrification Roadmap, um, which really helps articulate the benefits for uh, fleet electrification and what steps need to be taken uh, or what communities can be doing to take steps to electrify their fleets. And then lastly, I'll mention um, the uh, Drive Electric Northern Colorado, and in this case it's shorthanded driveelectricnoco.org. Um, it's just a good sort of website resource where there's lots of materials, lots of stuff that can be replicated um, if anyone's looking for specific program areas, whether it's how to run a ride and drive, 
uh, where we've had great success, how to coordinate a group buy program, uh, and as well as lots of other outreach education um, mark and marketing tools that can be utilized. And we encourage you know lots of sharing, lots of um, uh, uh, replicating. So I will at this point go ahead and and turn it back over uh, to the National Association of, of Regional Councils and uh, figure out if there are any questions that people have and uh, go from there. Thank you, Ben. Um, so we have some time for questions. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so by selecting the raise your hand button on your control panel or by typing a question into the questions box. Um, we have two or three initial questions. Um, the first is, is Enterprise renting Volts or, or, or Volts in Orlando? Great question. Uh, they are, are renting um, Volts with a V. Um, and if I, I'll you know, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about that because I do think when, uh, when we started this, we started it about two years ago and we now have a, a Department of Energy grant to help do a marketing and outreach campaign. Um, but it's a good example of disruptive business models and how EVs, while they're a great solution and can be the right, you know, they're going to be the right step forward and, you know, with 30 models being available in the coming years, uh, I think we're going to we're going to really see the, the the impact of those new models and 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 see some significant adoption. Um, but in this case, for enterprise, they have to um, rotate vehicles through in somewhere around five to seven minutes. So you return a car, they clean it, they fuel it, um, they and they want to get it back into circulation so that it can be rented right away. And um, when we tried full battery electric vehicles. The, uh, the ability to make that turnaround quickly happen just was too big of a burden uh, for enterprise at this early stage. Uh, the second piece is that for renters, um, you know, it's a big technological gap. If you're going to a new city that you're not that familiar with, um, and the idea that you need to then seek out charging stations and you're not sure where they are and it's already hard to get around, um, the benefit of using the Volt is it gives people that opportunity to try a plug-in electric vehicle, um, but with the, the convenience of utilizing gas when they need to. And so that was a, it's really been the right fit for the right system. Um, and I think that's true in fleet applications where, you know, sometimes plug-in hybrid electric vehicles are the best solution uh, for now and as technology is still being um, integrated and consumers are sort of figuring out how the system works. And maybe if I may, um, you can rent the Volt, uh, and if you go specific directly to our website, um, and I'll show it in just a second, uh, you actually can get a discount through us to, to rent the Volt uh, in Orlando, and um, is a highly recommended experience because you get free charging, free parking, uh, and, uh, and then you also get some other perks that are you know make you feel like sort of an electric VIP. And I'll, I'm pulling up the uh, website. Sorry, I was having a little, not able to talk and uh, and type for some reason. But maybe, uh, Cameron, if you want, go to the next question, and then I can show the website as well while it's while I'm answering. And this is the background on the program and where you can learn more. So pluginperks.com acts as the uh, resource to. Um, figure out how to rent the vault and learn more about the program. So, what's the, what's the next question? Uh, the next question is: uh, Is EVSE the only infrastructure investment option, or are are other fueling infrastructure allowed? Uh, there are other uh, other fueling is allowed, um, and uh, I don't know. I know more about the. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, EVSC is an, is an acronym that stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. Um, and uh, in this case, I don't know how the allocation breaks down and if there's a, a you know, sort of an incremental uh, cost, but yes, the money can be used for uh, other infrastructure in addition to um, uh, electric charging stations. Okay, and the next question is, will the ZEV money be only for the ZEV state? No, uh, that is a good question. The, uh, there isn't a specific, um, and I just figured I'd show this too while we're doing this. This is the, the program that exists in Drive Electric Program Colorado and is an example of the resource. Um, the, uh, the ZEV investment money 
uh, will be allocated on a program basis. Um, and uh, basically, the VW will have to get a program approved by uh, the EPA. Um, the only money that's specifically designated to a state uh, is um, the 800 million of that 2 billion that will go to California. Outside of that, uh, the rest of the money does not have a geographic designation. Okay, and the next question is, um, um, in my reading, I have sometimes found it hard to determine which provisions are California specific and which are universal to the rest of the country. In at least one set of provisions, I saw specific reference to the el eligibility of landside port facilities, such as cranes. Do you have any information on this uh, eligibility criteria? Uh, any any port can uh, you know port can be um, uh, can actually utilize the funding um, and in this case um, you know it can be any government owned marine shore power uh, they can actually do if they're doing cost associated with shoreside systems uh, they can it can be hundred percent funded um, if it's non-government owned marine shore power it can be um, up to 25 percent um, and, you know, like the examples in this case is it can be um, systems that enable um, compatible um, uh, uh, engines, vessel engines, to remain uh, off while they're at birth. Um, and then there's also uh, the ability for um, ocean-going vessels that, you know, they have to, you have to scrap them and, they, and then re be repowered with any uh, new, um, new tiers of diesel, which I'm not a diesel expert, but there can be. Uh, I believe they're tier three and tier four diesel um, or electric engines that can be upgraded. In some cases, those are options that um, that can exist. Uh, so, you know, a shore is a shore and a port is a port. It's, you know, that does obviously create some level of uh, priority for states that touch water. But, um, you know, and I don't know if that would, you know, Great Lakes um, and others might be eligible. I would have to assume that any um, because you can get to an ocean from a Great Lake, uh, that those would also be eligible. But, but that's a good question and one if you're curious and you're in a Great Lake area, I'd encourage you to look at the consent decree online for further information. Other questions? Cameron? I don't know if you guys lost me, but I haven't heard anybody else talk. Well, perhaps while we're waiting, uh, I will just mention that if people are interested in background documents, if you go to our website, uh, and go to the Electrification Coalition and you click on policy, you can see all the various documents um, and they are all downloadable. Uh, and this is a good example of the electrification roadmap that you can see. Uh, there's also um, different documents that show some of the Im impacts and financial impacts of plug in electric vehicle incentives. Uh, and then some examples of fleets that have made a transition uh, and what those impacts have been. So they're case study examples. And in this case, there's one on Houston uh, and one on Loveland, Colorado, uh, that are good uh, good resources for people to look at. So, any last questions? Nark, are you, the folks from National Association of Regional Councils, are you guys there, Cameron or, or Sarah? All right, well, um, unless there is anything else, uh, then I think maybe 
you know, we'll we'll wrap up. I'm not sure if the folks from uh, NARC dropped off uh, accidentally or can't uh, for whatever reason the um, the uh, audio isn't working. Um, but uh, just I think in my wrap up. Yep. Now I can. Oh, sorry. We we're having technical difficulties. Um, okay. The next question is: How are the beneficiary mitigation plans evaluated? Are there significant risks that some states will, be, will miss out on the funding? C can you repeat it one more time? And I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Are, are the how are the beneficiary mitigation plans evaluated? And are there significant risks that some states will miss out on the funding? Uh, so the um, the beneficiary uh, mitigation plans will be uh, evaluated by the EPA and the Clean Air Resources Board. Um, there is, uh, and I will put that under the conditional, that is my understanding, um, but uh, that information is very specifically articulated um, in, the, in the language and in the, the consent decree. Whoops, sorry, didn't mean to put that up. Um, and so uh, I would encourage that folks consider that um, and, and look at that information uh, to, to look more at how those, those, those will be um, uh, evaluated. But my understanding is it's through the EPA uh, and the Clean Air Resources Board um, that will be utilized to vet each of the respective plans from the beneficiaries. And then if a state does not um, request the funds, uh, within that uh, the window, uh, then they are essentially, and it's by, you know, the, it's defined by the consent decree. They are essentially um, uh, removing any ownership or um, expectation that they would receive funding. So they have to uh, file, and I, I, I will admit that I don't necessarily know the inner workings of how to confirm the filing, but my, but I, I do believe they have to file a specific document that can be. Uh, um, uh, pulled from the website uh, for the consent decree, and that that does need to be um, happen through the governor's office uh, under the idea that the gover governor is of, of a respective state is designating the beneficiary or who the trustee will be in a specific state. Other questions? I think maybe we lost our friends at the National Association of Regional Councils again. So, um, I'm just sending them a quick note. Um, okay, sorry. Um, yep. we, for some reason, I still I go out on mute. Um, the next question is, is there any trend in what state agencies are being designated as beneficiaries? Um, a majority of them are um, uh, either their, um, the state EPA um, is one, one example. Uh, in others, it is their, um, uh, their state uh, health uh, department. So it can be their air quality and uh, public health department. Uh, in some cases, it can also be, and it, and it is, the um, state energy office. Um, I am not, a, I understand or uh, believe that it can be a separate nonprofit or could, in this case, be a regional council, but I don't know of any example where that has been the case. I think in almost every place that I'm aware of, um, it has been uh, designated to a specific office that uh, is a part of the um, state government uh, or, and or direct governor's office. And the next question is, will ZEV money apply, also apply to near zero engine options? So uh, my understanding is um, it, they will follow the same guidelines as um, how a ZEV is defined in um, California. Um, and so it will include both full battery electric vehicles and uh, plug-in plug hybrid electric vehicles. Um, it could also include uh, fuel cell uh, vehicles. I'm not sure if it does include other alternative fuel vehicles that um, could be considered um, 
near ZEV, um, but it follows the same guidelines that the, have, has been designated by the Clean Air Resources Board, is, is my understanding. Good question. And the next question is, outside of the DERA option, will the funds be deemed non-federal for purposes of matching, say, CMAQ funds? Can, I don't, can you repeat that Sorry. one again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, outside of the DERA, DERA option, will the funds be deemed non-federal for purposes of matching, say, uh, CMAQ funds? So um, outside of DERA, which is the DERA program, which is essentially the diesel uh, replacement program, uh, I don't feel like I know what the right answer is to that. So I'm going to go ahead and, um, well, I will say this. Um, I know that for you know eligible buses, as an example, um, that it needs to be uh, models, you know, model years 2006 uh, or older. Um, and uh, and the eligible buses must be scrapped and may or uh, and or maybe repowered or replaced um, and can be with any new diesel alternative fuel or electric engine. And then there is a specific breakdown. So if you're you know there's a priority for government owned. Um, so if you're doing any of those things, you're repowering, you're purchasing a new one um, uh, either with diesel or other alternative fuels, or you're doing an electric engine. Uh, repower or purchase those can if it's a if it's a government owned eligible uh, bus uh, or you know those that are under um, uh, essentially under contract like a like a public school district or something that you can use the hundred percent of the money there is no match requirement right hundred percent of the funding can be used uh, for non government owned eligible buses um, then it can be um, 75% for all new purchase, so essentially covering 75% of the cost for a new electric bus. Um, and then same thing for uh, repowering. Um, there is, uh, and then if you're doing it with diesel, it's a slightly lesser amount, so it's something like 40% if you're repowering with diesel or 25% if you're purchasing a new diesel. And that's true in almost every instance where uh, trucks, um, any of the uh, repower or, you know, um, uh, re or purchasing new, uh, if it's government owned, it's basically 100% cost replacement. If it's non-government owned, it's somewhere between 40 and 75% with uh, a priority being given towards electrification. They, they give a significantly uh, larger amount or there's a larger amount allocated towards uh, the replacement or repower of an ele through electrification. The next question is, if a state refuses funding, what will happen to the funds? Uh, I believe they um, uh, then at that point it goes back into um, a I think at that point it gets reclaimed by um, essentially that that money is being um, released back to VW uh, you know what though let's do this one I'm gonna put a placeholder on that question uh, and see if I can't find out the answer because I don't I don't know for sure what happens to. I want to. I want to back back up a little and say I don't know for sure what happens if the funds aren't um, aren't requested or aren't aren't, um, aren't asked for by the state. So let me find out and get back to you, and you can share that with everyone. Okay. Um, and then the last question is: How many states have accepted the funding so far, and uh, have any refused? I'm. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do. Um, you know, I do know that most states have put forth a request uh, and that I've heard about, but you know, I I I don't have a tally of who has and who has not, and I do not. I am not aware of any state that has not requested uh, money or you know, at this point has decided not to participate. That doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, I'm just not aware of them. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, um, thank you, Ben, for joining us. As a reminder, you, you will receive an email within the next 24 hours with a link to a video of the presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we look forward to your participation on future webinars. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.